In the first half of the talk, I described annular Kovanov homology using closed home evaluation uh, in the SL2 setting. And in the second half, I like to discuss uh, what happens in the SL3 setting. So that's what I'll get into now. And I'll start with the discussion of setup of SL3 homology. So there are two types of SL3 foams. The first is oriented foams, and they appeared first in Hovanov's categorification of the SL3 link polynomial. And more recently, there are unoriented SL3 foams. These are studied by Hovanov and Robert, and this doesn't yield link homology, unlike the oriented uh, setting, but it's related rather to graph colorings and to gauge theoretic constructions introduced by Kronheimer and Rafka. And we consider both uh, oriented and unoriented foams, uh, SL3 foams, but in this talk, I'll just focus on the oriented ones, the ones that give link homology. So let me give a very brief outline of SL3 link homology with really no details. So in the SL3 story, circles in the plane, which appeared in the SL2 story, are rather replaced by webs. Here's what that means. So an oriented SL3 web, I'll probably just say web, it's an oriented trivalent graph, gamma. It's embedded in the plane. It also may contain closed loops, which have no vertices, but are still oriented. And it, there's this condition that each vertex is a source or a sink. So each the, the orientations on the edges are either all outgoing or all incoming at each vertex. These take the place of circles and what takes the place of cobordisms between circles, uh, these are the phones. These are cobordisms between webs. And I'll say more about that later. And just like in the SL2 setting, here we have the similar kind of need. We need modules, I'll call it bracket gamma for webs, and we need maps between these modules which are induced by phones. And universal construction provides uh, such modules and maps. Okay, let me talk about oriented SL3 phones now. So an oriented SL3 foam is a two-dimensional CW complex, and it has singularities of the form, the letter Y across an interval. So each point has a neighborhood, which is homeomorphic to either just a disk or to this tripod across an interval. So those are the singularities that are allowed. Moreover, the two-dimensional cells are like the complements of the singular parts all be oriented and at each singular circle or singular interval, the three orientations of the facet leading at this singular part have to all be incompatible. They all, in other words, they all induce the same orientation on this uh, singular line, which I've drawn in bold. So that's the orientation uh, dimension. And that kind of mirrors uh, this orientation requirement on the webs. So we consider this in the annular setting. So we consider an anchored foams. And what that is, is, well, it's a foam as before. It's embedded in R3. It intersects the line, possibly. But if it does intersect it, it intersects it in the interior of the facets, the two-dimensional sections are transverse. And as before, these, these intersection points, these anchor points, have to each have a, a label. But now it's in the either one, two, or three. So this is part of the data of an anchored foam. And as before the facets, well, here the, before we were only talking about surfaces, here the facets, the two dimensional parts may carry some dots, which can't, which can float on the facet, but can't jump across the singular parts. 
And here's an example. So the foam topologically is just three disks glued together along your boundary. Uh, here I've indicated on the singular part, the singular circle where the three disks meet that each of the facets induce this orientation on the circle. So that, that's how I'll specify the facet orientations. There's three total intersection points. Each facet intersects some labels in one, two, three, and each facet carries some number of dots. So that's a anchored phone. And as before, if you have an evaluation, you can use this universal construction uh, idea to define state spaces for webs in the punctured plane. You have some web now in the punctured plane, and you look at all the foams that bound your web, say gamma. You have this bilinear form kind of defined via your evaluation or your invariant. And you take the kernel, and you take this big free module, not the kernel. So it comes down to defining some evaluation of foams. And you, as I mentioned before, uh, you get functoriality uh, essentially for free. Functoriality under foam cobordisms. So now let me describe how the evaluation works. Uh, first, I need to introduce this notion of an admissible coloring. What that is, it's just a function from the set of facets of F to the set one, two, three. So it colors each of the facets by one, two, or three. And the requirement is that the three colors, sorry, the three facets that appear near each singular point, um, all three colors appear as I've drawn in this picture here. So this is an admissible coloring. And I'll let ADM, Adam of F, denote the set of admissible colorings of a foam. There may not, there may not be any. Uh, if you have an admissible coloring, C, and you have I and J between one and three, let F, I, J of C denote the union of the I and the J colored facets. So for example, in this picture, uh, F, one, two, you would just take this one colored sheet and this two colored sheet and you'd erase the three colored sheet. So this is some space and well, it, what is more precisely, F, I, J is a closed surface in R3, <clears throat> because at each singular line, you've removed one of the sheet, one of the facets. And so it's a, it's a surface, it's in R3, so it's orientable as well. And as be, similar to before, we'll let D sub I of C denote the number of dots on the facets, which are colored I, according to C. So this keeps track of the placement. Now, another piece of notation, if you have I in one in the set one, two, three, I'll let I prime and I double prime denote the complementary, the two complementary elements, so that together these three elements form the, the full set. It, the order is irrelevant. So we're going to define an evaluation here, it lives in three variable polynomial ring. And several pieces of evaluation formula. So P of F comma C is uh, the product of the variables X sub I raised to D sub I of C, which is the number of dots on the I colored facets. So this keeps track of the dots. And Q is given by this expression. Um, so it's a product over i less than j of terms xi minus xj raised to the exponent, which is one half the Euler characteristic of this surface fij. And this is a closed surface in R3, so it has oriented, uh, sorry, so it has, um, so it's orientable. It has even Euler characteristic. And this term q tilde, which is jarring, um, is the contribution from anchor points. And I'll say a little bit more about this on the next slide. But for, so the product here is over all the intersection points. And for each one, you have terms like this, 
product of two terms. And then there's the sine, which is um, which will be explained a little bit more in the next slide. And then you take a square root in a more or less natural way. And finally, you set the evaluation f uh, bracket fc to be uh, p times q tilde divided by q. There's this extra sign out here, uh, at negative one to the s of fc, which um, but it's a it's very important, but it it's a it's a sign that uh, is a little tricky. And the final evaluation, the total one, is just the sum over all the, the colorings, sum of the evaluations over the set. That's the evaluation. Let me describe this square root term, this q tilde, a little bit more. Um, so suppose you have this foam F and a coloring C, and suppose there's some anchor point P and the color of the point, meaning the color of the facet on which the point lies, is different from the label of that point, which the label is just fixed data from F. Then if you look under the square root for that anchor point, you're going to see a term that looks like X sub C of P minus X sub C of P. So this whole thing is going to be zero. And the evaluation for that coloring is also zero. On the other hand, otherwise, we just assume that every anchor point is colored according to its label. Otherwise, the evaluation is zero. And then P contributes under the square root term uh, one of three possibilities. So if the color and correspondingly the label is one, then uh, under the square root, uh, there's no sign because the product of these two terms is x sub one minus x sub two, x sub one minus x sub three. Uh, similar for if the color and the label are three, and then if the color is equal to two in this second row, that's the only kind of uh, time when the sign appears. And it's just there so that the term under the square root is really x sub one minus x sub two, x sub two minus x sub three, and not uh, in a different order, like x sub two minus x sub one. And we'll let n of i denote the number of anchor points labeled i. Uh, this is independent of the coloring again. Uh, then n i plus n j is equal to the number of intersection points of this surface Fij with the line. Fij is closed. This is necessarily even. And you can rewrite this q tilde in this form, in taking the square root in the, in the natural way. And this is assuming the condition this, that this first bullet point is not satisfied, that the color equals the label for every anchor point. Um, then you can write q tilde in this way. Otherwise, the evaluation is just zero uh, because you have something like x sub two minus x sub two. Okay, that's our evaluation. Um, what do we prove about it? Uh, for first thing we show is for a closed foam, the evaluation is really a polynomial. So if you look back here uh, for fixed coloring, you have these denominators. The evaluation is really a polynomial. Over if f is disjoint from the line, then this evaluation in terms of colorings uh, is the same as uh, the evaluation given by Mukai and Vaz in their universal SL3 link homology paper, up to a slight change of variables, just renaming variables. We can form state spaces, bracket gamma, for these webs in, in the function earlier, and similar to SL2 story, we have uh, bi-gradings. So there's a quantum grading um, given by this formula here. So the state space has a, is spanned by these foam cobordisms from the empty web to gamma. For such a cobordism, there's this formula for the quantum grading. This descends to the, to the state space, which is a quotient. Uh, this is kind of similar to what has appeared in the literature, except without this contribution of anchor points. We also have these local 
web isomorphisms. So these are local relations or isomorphisms on webs. So here for the first move a, a, a contractible circle and replace it with a three copies. Web with that circle removed, but with these uh, grading shifts, these are uh, curly braces or are grading shifts. And similar, you have the square relation, the bygone relation, and all the first three of these web isomorphisms are just about regions, lope some small disk in the web, which does not contain a puncture. And then this last one just says how to remove a single non-contractible circle and it, you do it in this way. And to prove this last one, we have a neck cutting relation for, which I didn't include here for a tube that goes around the line. Uh, yes. And using those local isomorphisms, we're able to identify state spaces. So what we show is if you have a web in the puncture plane, then the state space is free. It's a free module. And the rank is equal to the number of Tate colorings, not the graded rank. The graded rank can be computed recursively, but it's not. But if gamma is a contractible, if so, if the web is contractible in the function plane, then the graded rank is equal. You can compute it. I mean, this is the same as the usual SL3 story. It's just a Cooperberg polynomial. Uh, this is Cooperberg polynomial is a Laurent polynomial associated to any web. And uh, if you said, so let's say in a variable Q, if you say Q equal to one, you, it's the same as the number of Tate colorings, but this is only for contractible webs. But in an, any example, you can compute the graded rank uh, by applying these relations. Now, similar to the SL2 story, we also have an additional annular grading, as we might expect. Here, it's valued in this ring lambda. So it's a you take a free module on three generators, W1, W2, W3, a free abelian group on these generators, and you mod out by the relation W1 plus W2 plus W3. And so this is a rank two, free of rank two. And the way to define the annular grading, uh, well, it has to do with the intersect with the anchor points, of course. And for a foam cobordism, you define its annular degree to be given by this formula. It's a sum over all the anchor points. Each anchor point contributes W sub the label of that anchor point. And then there's a sign S of P, which is the oriented intersection number. So that you orient the line in some way, all the facets are oriented. So each anchor point uh, happens when you intersect this line with this two-dimensional oriented uh, object and you take the oriented intersection number. So just plus or minus one. Okay, so I'll show you one more word about this lambda grading later, uh, but just to tie this in with link homology. So if you have an oriented link L in, in the thickened annulus, you form the SL3 chain complex in the standard way. Maybe if someone is familiar with uh, Hoano homology, the SL2 story, but not the SL3 story, at these crossings, you take similar, you take zero one resolutions in some way, except now, instead of just circles in the plane, you have SL3 webs. And you apply this state space construction to uh, the cube of resolutions, and you get this equivariant <coughs> annular SL3 homology, and it has homological gratings, it has quantum grading, and you can see that the differential does not change the annular grading. Um, so it also has an annular grading, this lambda grading. And one word about this, <clears throat> this annular degree is Kefalek and Rose defined non-equivariant annular Kavana Brzezanski SLN homology for any N using traces of Categorified quantum groups, they show that it has an action of SLN. This generalizes a result of Grigsby, Lakata, and Werley in the 
SL2 setting. And from this perspective, this lambda grading is kind of expected. It's like the SL3 weight lattice, even though we don't have an SL3 action in the equivariant setting or an SL2 action in the, non, in the, in the equivariant setting from the first. And that's all I'll say about the oriented SL3 foams and the link homology. Uh, and I want to end with just one word about the unoriented foams. So these were introduced by Kalanov and Robert and they're combinatorial versions of gauge theoretic constructions, which uh, Ronheimer and Rovka introduced and they're related to graph colorings. And unoriented SL3 foams are also, you should, one thinks about them as cobordisms between now unoriented tri trivalent planar graphs and they have additional, we allow additional singularities, which look like I've drawn here. Um, and we also discuss these un unoriented story in our paper, um, but the unoriented story in general is like even uh, state spaces cannot be identified even without the, uh, in the non-anchored setting. Um, that you, one can't necessarily reduce uh, state spaces recursively using these uh, local isomorphisms. Okay, thank you for listening.